Julie is my name. When I was nine years old, life took me by surprise. Dad had been ill for some time, but it wasn't until he passed away that I truly understood what was going on. He was present one day, and the next there was nothing at the dinner table. Mom filled that room in no time. A few months later, she brought Frank home. I suppose loneliness strikes quickly. It was obvious that Frank didn't want me around when he moved in like he owned the home. This is Frank, Julie. On the day he moved in, Mom introduced us. This is my daughter, Julie, Frank. His expression was icy, as if he would rather be somewhere else than staring at me. Hi, I said, attempting to be kind despite my shyness. Frank didn't even grin. He just nodded. He looked at his mother. Sarah, can we talk about the living arrangements? As they left with his hand on her shoulder, I recall being cold. It was not long before I began to feel alienated. Frank was always on my case and had rules for everything. Avoid leaving your belongings in the living room. Eat more quickly or excessive loudness. It was unrelenting. Mom did nothing except nod in agreement with whatever Frank said, her eyes vacant or perhaps simply worn out. At supper one evening, the situation became heated. A glass of water flowed toward Frank when I unintentionally knocked it over. Stupid child, is there nothing you can do correctly? As the water slapped his jeans, Frank yelled and sprang to his feet. I stumbled, my cheeks getting hot. Sorry, Frank, it was just an accident, I said. I apologize, Julie, but it doesn't clear up the mess. Be more careful, he reprimanded, raising his voice over what was required. Mom was silent as she sat there wiping her lips with a tissue. I stared at her in the hopes that she would say something, anything, to support me, but she didn't. I overheard them fighting in their room after supper. Frank spoke in a strong, loud voice. That child of yours needs to mature, Sarah. Because you're accustomed to turmoil, I won't live in it either. I heard snippets of Mom's faint response. Please, Frank, remember that she is only a child. She's still getting used to it. Changing. Months have passed. If nothing changes, I'm informing you. The rest I didn't hear, but I didn't have to. It was an obvious message. Mom wasn't resisting the notion, and Frank wanted me out of the way. The months that followed were as difficult. Mom's quiet got heavier as Frank's rants became the regular background music. I was trying to be quiet and to blend in as much as possible, but you can't really blend in at home, can you? Even a nine-year-old is aware of that. When Mom announced she was pregnant, things at home became more complicated. Frank wasn't very thrilled by the news, and he already had his hands full simply putting up with me. It took him a long minute to speak, and when he did, his words were chilly and truncated. Well, Sarah, that's fantastic. His tone was brimming with what sounded a lot like sarcasm as he remarked, just what we needed. Mom only grinned, a little too pathetically. Frank, it's a blessing. You'll see, a new beginning for us. I recall experiencing a mixture of fear and excitement. It felt like a fantasy to have a younger sibling, someone with whom to bond. I wasn't really sure, though, because of Frank's mood swings. After several months, the baby eventually came. They called her Anna, and it was a girl. I was ecstatic. My heart melted when I saw her for the first time, all wrapped up in her pink blanket. She was very small. I hoped that Anna's presence would improve matters and maybe soften Frank's stance. It felt lovely to hold Anna. Her little fingers were grabbing at nothing because she was so small. Hi, Anna. Julie, I'm your big sister. I said, I'm going to take good care of you, and I vowed to support her no matter what. However, the magic was short-lived. The dynamics were altered once more when Anna was brought home. Frank was more picky as ever, particularly when it came to money. 
I heard him conversing with Mom in the kitchen one evening, maybe a week after Anna returned home. His tone was harsh and too loud. Sarah Morcos. Formula, diapers, and who knows what else. What about Julie? I'm paying for her, even though she isn't even mine. Mom spoke in a low whisper. Please, Frank, she's only a kid. We can handle anything. Things will calm down. Sarah, it's more than simply managing. It has to do with priorities. Now we must consider our family. Our actual family. That meant something to me. I wasn't actually related. I felt the pain of their remarks. Trying not to cry, I hugged my knees as I slid down the wall beside my door. Frank sitting us down in the living room one evening was the last straw. His eyes avoided mine, his expression solemn. Sarah, we need to think about the future. Julie's getting older and expenses are piling up. Maybe it's time she went to live with her Aunt Claire. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut, sent away just like that. Mom finally spoke, looking at me, her eyes sad. Julie, honey, it might not be so bad. Aunt Claire has a nice house, and you'll be well taken care of. But Mom, I don't want to go. I want to stay here with you and Anna. The room went silent. Frank's next words were cold and final. It's decided then. I'll call Claire in the morning. Moving in with Aunt Claire was like stepping into a different world. Her house was big, clean, and always silent. Too silent for comfort. The first day I arrived, she laid down her laws like we were setting terms for a peace treaty after a long war. You'll follow my rules under my roof, Julie. No nonsense. No mess. No back talk, she declared as she led me through the hall to what would be my room. The room was plain, with bare walls and a single bed against the corner. It felt nothing like home. I nodded, too tired and too upset to argue. Homework right after school. Chores before dinner. And lights out by nine. I won't tolerate any laziness or sloppiness. You hear. Aunt Claire continued, her voice firm. Yes, Aunt Claire, I responded, my voice a whisper. Speak up when you're spoken to. Let's have no mumbling here, she snapped. I quickly corrected my tone. Yes, Aunt Claire, I understand. The days that followed blended into each other, each as strict and unforgiving as the last. Aunt Claire was tough, tougher than anyone I'd ever known. She had a way of making simple conversations feel like interrogations. Homework was a battlefield, too. If I got a B instead of an A, Aunt Claire had words that stung sharper than any I'd heard before. You can do better than this. Your laziness won't fly here, she'd scold, even though I'd spent hours poring over books. The worst was how she reminded me of my mom's decision to send me away. If I dared to talk back or ask for less criticism, she'd retort sharply, no wonder your mom sent you here. You need discipline. You obviously weren't getting it. Those words hurt. They always did. They made me feel unwanted, unloved, like I was just another problem mom had to solve by shipping me off. Days turned into weeks and weeks into months. I learned to keep my head down, do as told, and speak only when necessary. Aunt Claire had no patience for tears or complaints, and I had no energy left to find. It's for your own good, she'd often say after a particularly harsh scolding, as if the sting of her words was supposed to mold me into someone better. I wasn't sure who that better person was supposed to be. All I knew was I was getting really good at being alone, at being quiet, at not being a problem. Because in Aunt Claire's house, not being a problem was the best thing you could be. Living with Aunt Claire was suffocating, and I found myself missing my mom more each day, even though I knew she had let me go without much of a fight. One afternoon, the longing got too much. Aunt Claire was out, probably at her bridge club, 
and I knew I had a couple of hours at least. Her phone was always left on the kitchen counter, charging next to the fruit bowl. It seemed like my only link back to my old life. I hesitated for a minute before I picked it up, dialing my mom's number. It was muscle memory. I hadn't forgotten it. Maybe I never would. My heart was racing as I heard the phone ring once, twice, then her voice. Hello. Mom, it's me, Julie. There was a pause. A breath, maybe. Then, Julie, why are you calling? I swallowed hard, my throat tight. I just wanted to hear your voice. Another pause, longer this time than cold. Hard. You shouldn't have called, but Mom. Julie, listen to me. You need to stop this. I can't have you calling me. But why? I miss you, Mom. I miss home. When can I come back? Her voice was flat, emotionless, as if she were discussing the weather. You can't. That's done. Don't call here anymore. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Mom, please, just don't. Julie, there's nothing here for you. Goodbye. She hung up, and the line went dead. The silence in the kitchen was deafening. I felt my hands shake as I put the phone back on the charger. The finality in her voice broke something in me. She didn't want me. She really didn't want me anymore. Tears blurred my vision as I stumbled to my room. I closed the door softly, not wanting to make any noise that might hint at my rebellion. I sat on the floor, my back against my bed, and let myself cry. The room felt smaller than ever, a box that was slowly closing in on me. About an hour later, I heard the front door open and close. Aunt Claire's voice called out, Julie, you better have finished your chores. Yes, Aunt Claire, I called back, wiping my eyes quickly with the back of my hand. I didn't want her to see any signs of weakness. Weakness was not tolerated here. I went to the kitchen to help with dinner as if nothing had happened, but inside I was different. I felt emptier, more alone. Mom's voice, those final words, played over and over in my head. That night, Aunt Claire discovered the call log on her phone. Her face twisted into a scowl as she stormed into my room, her voice a harsh whisper that cut through the quiet. So you took my phone to call your mother. Thought you'd go behind my back. I froze, the blood draining from my face. I, I just wanted to hear her voice. Aunt Claire laughed, a harsh, grating sound. And what did that get you, huh? She doesn't want you, Julie. Even you can't deny it now. Her words were like ice, and I felt them chill me to the bone. She grabbed my arm, her grip tight and painful. No more phone. No more pity parties. You're here because she doesn't want you. Remember that. The punishment was severe, more chores, stricter rules, and the cold shoulder from Aunt Claire who made sure every day thereafter that I felt just how unwanted I was. Aunt Claire's house had become a prison, each day dragging heavier than the last. It was clear I was nothing but a burden to her, a nuisance she tolerated only because she had to. But even that thin thread of obligation snapped one chilly morning, a year into my stay. You're packing your bags today, Julie. Aunt Claire announced over breakfast, her voice stern and final. I stared at her, spoon halfway to my mouth. What? Why? Your mother stopped sending money. No money, no reason to keep you here. She replied bluntly, sipping her coffee as if we were discussing something as trivial as the weather. I felt a cold dread settle in my stomach. So what happens to me now? She shrugged a cold, dismissive gesture. Not my problem. You can go live with your grandmother. If she won't take you, then it's the orphanage. The thought of going to an orphanage terrified me, but the mention of grandma sparked a tiny flicker of hope. I hadn't seen her since I was little, barely remembered her, but surely she wouldn't turn me away. 
Packing my bags felt surreal, like I was stripping away layers of my life at Aunt Claire's. Each item a reminder of the year I'd lost. Aunt Claire drove me to Grandma's. The car ride was silent except for the hum of the engine. We arrived at a modest house, smaller in cozier than Aunt Claire's imposing place. Grandma was waiting at the door, her expression unreadable. This is Julie, your granddaughter, Aunt Claire said, not bothering with niceties. I can't keep her anymore. Sarah stopped paying. Grandma looked me over, her eyes sharp but not unkind. I see. Come in, Julie. Aunt Claire didn't linger. With a brief nod, she left, her duty discarded as easily as she'd disposed of me. Inside, Grandma's house was warm, filled with the scent of cinnamon and something sweet baking. It felt welcoming, a stark contrast to Aunt Claire's sterile environment. You'll be staying in the guest room. I suppose we'll need to sort out some more permanent arrangements, Grandma said, leading me down the hall. The guest room was small, with a window overlooking the garden. It felt safe, a word I hadn't associated with a place in a long time. Thank you, Grandma, I said, my voice low, still unsure of my welcome. She nodded. We're family, Julie. You belong here more than anywhere else. Over the next few weeks, I adjusted to life with Grandma. It was different. She was strict, but there was a kindness to her rules, a gentleness in her reprimands. You need to do your chores, Julie. Everyone contributes here, she would remind me, but her tone was patient, not harsh. Yes, Grandma, I would respond, grateful for her fair approach. Living with Grandma, I began to heal. I found solace in the quiet routine of our days, the peaceful nights, and the steady rhythm of life that was so different from the chaos with Aunt Claire. The months rolled by, and on my 16th birthday, Grandma made a decision that would seal our bond forever. Over breakfast, she slid an envelope across the table to me. Take a look at this, Julie, she said, her voice carrying a mix of seriousness and warmth. I opened the envelope, pulling out some official-looking papers. What's this? It's adoption papers, Julie. I want to adopt you. Make things official so no one can ever make you feel unwanted again, she explained, watching me closely for my reaction. I felt a lump form in my throat. Really, Grandma? You mean it? Yes, I do. You're not just staying here, Julie. You're my family, and it's time we made that clear to everyone else, too. A few weeks later, it was done. We went to court, and I officially became Julie Bennett, with a new sense of belonging that I had longed for since Mom sent me away. With Grandma's support, I started looking towards the future. She encouraged me to focus on my studies, particularly science, which had always fascinated me. You've got a sharp mind for it, Julie. You could go into medicine. How would you like that? She suggested one day as we were going over some of my school projects. I'd love that, Grandma. I want to help people, I replied, the idea taking root. Then it's settled. We'll get you into a good college program. I'll support you every step of the way, she declared, her determination clear. True to her word, Grandma was there for me throughout my high school years. She tutored me in math and science, using her old school methods that were strict but effective. You need to understand the basics, Julie. Can't skip the foundation. She'd insist whenever I struggled with complex problems. I graduated with top marks thanks to her unwavering support. Grandma then helped me navigate the daunting college application process. When I got accepted into a medical college with a partial scholarship, she was as proud as if she received the acceptance herself. We'll manage the finances. Don't you worry about that, Grandma said when I fretted over the costs. You focus on your studies. Become the best doctor you can be. Medical school was tough but fulfilling. I was drawn to oncology, 
the branch of medicine that dealt with cancer. It was hard emotionally and intellectually, but it felt right like I was exactly where I needed to be. I completed my degree, then my internship, and finally my residency, each step a milestone that Grandma celebrated. You're making a real difference, Julie. I'm so proud of you, she'd say, her eyes shining with pride. By the time I turned 32, I was fully established in my career as an oncologist. My life was busy but fulfilling, filled with long hours at the hospital and the satisfaction of knowing I was making a difference. Through it all, Grandma was my anchor, always there to listen and offer advice on tough days. But life, as it often does, threw another curveball my way. Grandma's health, which had been declining, took a turn for the worse. It was swift and unexpected, the kind of decline that leaves you scrambling to catch your breath. I remember coming home one evening, tired after a particularly tough day at the hospital. Grandma was sitting in her favorite armchair, looking out the window. Her voice was weaker when she called me over. Julie, come sit with me for a bit, she said, patting the chair next to her. I sat down, taking her hand in mine. It felt fragile, like a dried leaf that might crumble under too much pressure. I'm not going to beat around the bush, she started, her tone serious. The doctors, they say it's not much time now. We need to talk about things. Practical things. The lump in my throat grew, and my eyes stung with tears. Grandma, please. She squeezed my hand, her grip still strong. No tears now, Julie. We've got things to sort out. You need to be ready. The next few weeks were a blur of doctor's visits, late nights, and legal paperwork. Grandma wanted to ensure everything was in order for me, that there would be no complications with her estate or her wishes. When the end came, it was peaceful. Grandma passed away in her sleep at home, just as she'd wanted. The emptiness her passing left was palpable, a silence in the house that was too heavy to bear at times. Planning the funeral was hard. I went through her address book, calling relatives and friends. The responses were polite, some even warm, but it became clear that not many would make the effort to come. My heart ached, not just for the loss of grandma, but for the loneliness of this farewell. The funeral day was quiet, the chapel more empty than not. I stood there feeling oddly detached as the priest spoke about life, loss, and legacy. It didn't take long after the funeral when the past I thought I'd left behind came knocking at my door. My mother, stepfather, and their daughter, who was now 20 years old, showed up unexpectedly. My mother didn't waste any time. Julie, you need to share the inheritance your grandmother left you, she demanded, her tone entitled. I stared at them, disbelief mixing with anger. You left me, remember? Twenty years ago, you decided I was too much of a burden. My mother's face twisted into a sneer. Ungrateful girl. Now you're a rich doctor with an inheritance. You owe us. I laughed, the sound bitter. Grandma adopted me legally. You're nothing to me now. The shock on her face was almost comical. My stepfather, ever the bully, leaned in. You're going to regret this, Julie. As they left, I slammed the door behind them, the click of the lock sounding unusually satisfying. Standing there, my back against the door, I felt a mix of relief and renewed determination. I received a call from a neighbor while I was at work a few days after their initial visit. It appears that your family is back at your residence, Julie. Furniture has been brought in by them. They appear to be moving in or something. Their car was parked in front of me when I came into the driveway, which made my stomach turn. As if they owned the property, my mother, stepfather, and stepsister were unloading boxes in the living room when I walked in. What are you doing? Trying to maintain a calm voice, I demanded. My mom spun around, pretending to be shocked. 
We're just getting settled, Julie. This is family property, after all. No, it isn't. Grandma formally bequeathed this house to me. You must go right now. With a sly smile, my stepfather walked forward. Construct us. We deserve a piece of this house since we are family. I could sense my anger rising within me. It's been more than 20 years since you were family. You cannot simply come here and take what is rightfully yours. Finally, my stepsister, who was observing from the side, spoke out. Julie, please stop being so callous. All we're requesting is what's just. Fair. I let forth a harsh, acrid chuckle. Why is it fair to leave a child behind? Why just turn up when you believe there is money to be made? They only scowled and shouted curses without any responses. Declaring, I'm calling the police, I took out my phone. My mom made an effort to stop me. You'll regret this, Julie. For years, I've regretted ever knowing you. I said, this is nothing new, and phoned 911. The police showed up in a flash. I gave them an explanation and showed them the court records attesting to Grandma's will and my ownership of the house. The police were stern. The one that informed my mother and stepfather, you need to leave. This property doesn't belong to you. And if you don't comply, you'll be removed forcibly. Despite his obvious displeasure, my stepfather scowled at me, but he was unable to help. He said, this isn't over, Julie, as they grabbed their belongings. Oh, but it is, I said in a chilly, decisive tone. I went around the house, through Grandma's house, after they left. Recollections flooded every area. Every nook and cranny bears witness to her love and the life she had created here, a life she had battled to give me. I vowed to myself as well as to her, standing in her favorite location by the window. I refused to allow my future to be mired by the resentment of the past. I would keep fighting to respect her legacy and the sacrifices she made for me because I had worked hard to become who I am.